Most undeliverable mail is beyond unremarkable, as you can imagine. <laughs> Crossing over into the territory of Dull. A series of mundane correspondences detailing travel plans and financial matters, or even, dare I call them ordinary, emotional matters that are no more interesting to those uninvolved than the nocturnal adventures of others, such are dreams. Of course, every rule has its exception, and that is the case with the undeliverable mail that never made it to Westermark Manor, so named for the surname of its former inhabitants, scattered on the winds like embers after the fires. The final correspondence is a series of confessions, referred to as cleansings, from the original manor's matriarch, Charlotte Westermark. Previously presumed deceased, a body having been found in her chambers amidst the burnt-out remains of the man. All but one of these correspondences seems to have been mandated as part of her participation in the group she refers to as the Warm Dark We, whose enticements are specific in the contents. The letters were sent shortly after the second fire, although it is not clear by whom. The timing kept them from reaching the intended recipients, and given the contents, perhaps it is better that they did not. As to the reasons for this, they are best addressed by the letters. Unable to add anything else, I will begin reading now. To my children, this is my first and... Should God be willing to grant me the perfection required and the guidance through the spirits that surround us always, last cleansing. This is unlikely. Only one was able to cleanse a single time before becoming we, the warm dark we. And his cleansing contained only the notes needed to concoct the potion. The concoctor will not accept the title of leader. It is telling that none of us would dream of thrusting it upon him. I have encountered him in his glowing eyes and prodigious engine and hands that move like water yet feel like a fire warming all of me from just the perfect distance. <laughs> his hands have found me amidst a storm of heaves, which I must explain is something that we, the warm dark we, explore not only between two as common decency would dictate, as all I ever imagined prior to coming to the unlit estate, a place unreachable and invisible to the uninitiated. No, we shun common decency, preferring to operate from a place of a far superior uncommon decency, which allows for vast corporeal storm of heaves. Strange contrast from the starvation of such expressions prior, during my life at Westermark Manor. Not due to the common parlance that women are meant to be coy and find pleasure in motherhood, rather than the bed. For I played my modest part while remaining willing, letting myself be led in the dance, as it were. But this role required silence when our amorous congress died down. People become boring to each other in body and mind, and your father's thirst was being satisfied by others even as my own remained unquenched. <sighs> Had I been more worldly, smarter, I would neither have made demands of your father nor abided by this, for although indiscretion is more shameful for women, this is only true of those who get caught. I suppose the increasing betrayal by my own body, invaded from within by that fickle and most unpleasant beast, neuralgia, did not help, nor the drugs I took for it. I was sharp and agitated if I took too many energizing drops, and lethargic with too much soothing syrup, making socialization a challenge. So I was left alone with my pain, one day hot, sharp, and lightning fast, the next dull, cold, and wet, always with no apparent cause for these sensations. I found myself distracted, in so much discomfort as to be taken from most every conversation. 
Driven to my chambers, I was negligent in my role as mother all too often. What's worse, my pain spoke to me over much of what you would tell me, my children. Pain and the dreams sold to me by the druggist in the form of energizing drops and soothing syrups created a fog between me and all I saw or did. Both swallowed your words and plagued my every hour until I encountered we, the warm dark we, outside the druggist on a fall day made dim by low clouds. For we loathe the light, more the longer we are on the potion, until our eyes glow. Though for now mine remain the same, and it is difficult for me to imagine hating the light more than I already do. For the cleansing, there is a candle burning, a vile thing. But only through cleansing may I be released from the light to take more potion and go back into we, the warm dark we, and to let the same back into me. So I must persist with my tale. <laughs> My excursion to the druggist was a usual errand initially, notable only for the man who stood against the doorframe and tipped his hat at me, both upon my entrance and exit, despite that I did not reciprocate either time, offering only a slight and sly modest smile, not reflective of the thrill I felt, for though he offered a common gesture, the attentiveness beyond the mundane and the way his eyes found me set me aflutter. Do not ask me to explain, I could not immediately return to Westermark Manor, as would have been commonplace in the absence of further errands. I suppose I needed a break from my routine so desperately that all it took was a tip of the hat and a look from a dashing stranger. I wandered for a bit, eventually reaching a willow tree, golden and heavy, to find the stranger from the druggist approaching from the opposite direction. He told me that the spirits had brought him there to find me, and I said that although I had no distinct otherworldly conversation, I had been drawn there myself. When I reached into my reticule for an energizing drop, he touched my arm and told me that he had a better remedy for my affliction than anything the druggist sold. These were words I had heard before. The woman whose body was found in place of mine had lightened my purse previously with her nostrum. As if in my head, he offered me some of the potion without asking recompense. It slid down my throat and through my limbs. I was painless for the first time since prior to having children, before failing to get all I was supposed to out of motherhood, and in my failure taking from you, my children, some of what it means to be human, if that's enough of a confession. Goodbye for now, into the warm dark we. <sighs> To my Morgan, Daniel, and Madeline. Forgive me, forgive me, not for the soothing of my own soul, but for your own peace. For I will never know if you have forgiven me, unless the spirits tell me, although, should this happen, I am uncertain if I will care. Once more I must cleanse. There is little I would not have done, after experiencing the painlessness of the potion, to continue a life of relief, although it was not for this reason, that what I am about to describe happened. I will resume where I left off beneath the willow tree. As the potion took effect, I found my eyes wandering across the stranger's body and my thoughts drifting to what was beneath his clothes. He asked me how I felt, a question I had not been asked in some time. And I talked at length about bodily sensations and emotional revolutions brought on by the potion. <laughs> Even as I was aware that this magical elixir had already begun to consume me, nothing new to me after years of taking soothing syrups and energizing drops. He listened in an uncommon way, and I found as noontime came and passed, that I was opened and exposed in a way I had never imagined a human could be and it felt good to be seen. It was I who drew his mouth to mine, knowing that he would not deny me, not due to the uncontrollable appetite of a man, for that in practice is a myth, but because our desire was as air in the canopy beneath the tree. 
We came together and I came alive in ways previously unimaginable to me. It is difficult for me to say which is more challenging, confessing things such as these, tawdry behaviors that in many ways I hope you never read about, for I myself taught you to condemn others for such actions, or writing you with no chance of response. I suppose, at least to an extent, this is how parents and children always communicate with each other. <laughs> Scarcely is there a larger crime than talking back when you are very young. For backtalk certainly eclipses whatever sin the child may not defend with so insolent an act as speech. This establishes large portions of the relationship while also leaving mothers to find the tables turn and their words become weightless and pointless compared to those of their sons as they become men. With the weighted words of men distinct from those of a well-bred woman who knows her place is one of silence. Tables turn with daughters who have the undeniable power of beauty, and whether she is aware or oblivious to the fact that the world will always value her more for her looks than her ideas, it is a power daughters hold over their mothers, even as they gaze their own fate. Such is the way with children, and over and over the result is not but silence. <clears throat> Motherhood is supposed to be every woman's greatest joy, the ultimate expression of femininity. It makes us whole. I never found this to be so, but could not admit it. <laughs> While the arrival of Adeline showed me that my heart could fill with unconditional love, it was not long until time proved that such love, a consuming adoration, does not bring purity of action either to the mother or child. When she died, grief erased our sins, mother and child each, as mourners touted my perfection until I believed it. I found any actions of hers that vexed me could not be recalled, an obliteration I could not recreate with you, my other children. But this does not mean that I did not love you, although we, the warm dark we, do not love except for we. I suppose I know that this will not be my last cleansing. Candle hurts my head more this time than the last, but we, the warm dark we, need sin on the page, even as all I want is to be enfolded once more. Goodbye for now, into the warm dark we. <sighs> to my Morgan, Daniel, and Madeline, to the best I can tell it is spring. I picture you in the sun, warm and soothing on your skin, not blinding and terrible as it certainly would be for me now. Although it is the bright green renewal of spring in part that brought me to here, which I suppose requires some explanation. <laughs> After my encounter at the willow tree, little else held interest for me and I had long ago established a life where I held little interest to anyone, with the possible exception of Madeline who, Seeing me with foliage in my hair and misaligned buttons inquired if this was the fashion and if she should start adopting it. Having seen everyone else in the family, she was the only who noticed my disheveled state. I quickly answered that it was most unfashionable in fact, and that I myself had been misled by the same notion and I asked her to help me pull myself together. my vanity as she brushed through my hair was the only moment of hesitation I had, the only instant that almost kept me from pursuing the potion and, eventually, my life at the unlit estate. Yet her chatter, endless for having become accustomed to my day's state, put me into another type of distraction. Even as she asked if the pain in my limbs was particularly unbearable that day, mistaking the cause of my silence for what it had always been. Her hand on my shoulder, she asked this like a woman grown. It was then I saw that all the things I was intended to pursue in life had already come to fruition and matured. They were passing so quickly as to be all but gone already. All that was left for me was to watch your pursuit of the same, but I was younger of face than I had been the day before, the week before. A second youth bestowed on me by the potion which I thirst for even now, 
just as every part of my body longs to go join we, the warm dark we, where I can hear them ushering in each other, the agony of bliss. But first, of course, I must be cleansed. They will not have me unless I am cleansed. The next day, I woke to find myself energetic and painless. I left Westermark Manor and, as if pulled by gravity, found myself at the druggist. Though I had no interest in his wares or those of the little witch who stood outside in some profane mockery, for she stood in the place of the gentleman from the day prior. I went into the dress shop down the avenue and ordered a simple red velvet gown, an item eventually surrendered to we, the warm dark we, as part of my compensation for my place at the unlit manor. I went to the graveyard, the seaside, and of course, the willow, all about a meandering path, but was remiss for not once did I encounter we, the warm dark we. The next day I took the same walk, except that I replaced the dress shop with the milliner, and the next day the same, with the shoe shop, and the next day, and the next, until I ran out of places to go, and found myself just walking without aim, even as my pain and twitching returned, and my hope fleeted. <sighs> it was not until I returned to the dressmaker to pick up my order, an errand that would have been my only for the day, for I had dismissed my experience beneath the willow finally as a passing dream, that I saw her. She of we, the warm dark we. Although there was no reason for me to connect the woman at the counter with the man in front of the druggist, she did not tip her hat the same way, and the attention she paid me was far more coy. Instantly I recognized her as we, the warm dark we, and she was like honey to me. She left the dress shop first, and though my impulse was to leave my wares in order to rush after her, this prospect was inopportune, and she realized this, smiling just before the door closed as I looked where moments before she stood. <laughs> I could not hasten the process. All I was able to do was rush out the door once my parcel was in my hands. I lacked the decorum to contain my desperate expression as I looked around outside the shop, and in my frantic state, I almost did not see her where she stood separated from me across a bustling crowd. She turned with no overt indication that I should follow her, but I could not resist, and having since been in her place, luring others in the way she did me, I can say there was an awareness on her part that I was enraptured and elated. Overjoyed that this was not, like so many other good things, just a passing whimsy, as is so much of life. No longer doomed to suffer disappointment, I followed her down my own path, to the druggist, the graveyard, and the seaside, where she waited so we could walk side by side to the willow tree. There we partook of the potion and each other. She stroked my hair while I shared the fears that she had dispelled with her presence, the loneliness of longing. Though I steeled myself for her dismissal of my concerns, having found this reaction to be the norm, instead she told me she understood and said that, if anything, she wanted to be there with me, doing the things we were, even more than I with her, and I relaxed at long last as she held me in the grass. There I found myself face to face with a little lost sprout, light green and new and hopelessly lost in the wrong season. And so too was I face to face with all the spring times during which I had neglected to witness anything but the dull passage of time within the dark walls of the manor as I laid down and let my life go by in an endless duration of pain after pain. But it was mine to look at the beauty and choose to reject further neglect going forward. So I turned to her and devoured her right down to her cloven inlet. Once more until her bliss was palpable. And these two small things, the sprout and the miracle of we, the warm dark we, made up, if only for the while, for the years of my negligence of life. Goodbye for now, into the warm dark we. 
To my Morgan, Daniel, and Madeline, I suppose by now it must be summer. We, the warm dark we, go out at night. We love going out at night, witnessing each other's eternally youthful bodies in the dark absent any intrusive moon. We sleep in heavily curtained rooms, four or five to a bed to keep warm, not a stitch of clothing anywhere. We have no reason for it. But our nights have been short and warm of late, and so it must be summer as we lay on the wet grass and we glow through the walled-in world of our estate like children who have not been deterred from taking each other in as instinct dictates. And the potion, the potion with the warm outdoor air is somehow better even than it was in the fall, and sometimes I fear that I will float up into forever or burst with glee, becoming part of the atmosphere. And yet another cleansing. I need yet another cleansing. On my first visit to the unlit estate, there sat at the table shivering portions of we, the warm dark we, composing confessions meant to cleanse. Now these are the ones whose eyes glow, and they are even more averse to the light than ever before. One cannot expect a miracle such as the potion to be all youth in body and face, communion with the spirits in each other. Those who glow have some perception beyond what is normal when it comes to the bodies of others, and while they can no longer feel the elative effects of the potion so profoundly, it is no matter, at least this is what they say. Though this remains to be seen, it seems that in the same way that I am always on the brink of exploding into the atmosphere, they can feel their slow return into the earth, a gradual dissolving, though they do not articulate this, and I hate to speculate. My first venture to the estate was after several encounters at the Willow, each more difficult to return from. But even more, after seeing the estate, after experiencing so many of my kindreds, I did not want to return to the manor, where our life in my presence or absence seemed much the same, despite that it was there my heart was meant to forever reside. I returned having been told that a graceful exit from the bright world is always preferable, and besides, I needed some goods to pay my way. The black Orlov alone would suffice, however the diamond combined with any unnamed jewelry and a few of my finer pieces of clothing could allow we, the warm dark we, even greater security. The prospect of taking these was so strange, a self that I thought I wanted to be stealing from who I have always been. The afternoon after the first visit, I stood at the gate of Westermark Manor, unable to make myself go in and ready to spin on my heel and take my chances with whatever wolves waited in the wild world. All the while reminding myself that this would mean I might not get back to the potion or we, the warm dark we, and the body we share when we are together. It was an unbearable thought, but my feet remained planted and it was in this state that I stood looking up at the manor when Adeline beckoned to me from inside the house and I came home for very nearly the last time. Her spirit talks to me even now. She tells me that she watches over Madeline constantly, and though she does her best to guide and protect, that a girl who spends her whole life too far away from or too close to the fire is doomed to burn or freeze to death. She tells me that Daniel is meant for his own convergence, profound and otherworldly, beyond just flesh and spirit. She says beyond the spirit within his own body, Morgan is incapable of perceiving the ethereal, even when encountered with it face to face. Assessments I do not argue with. It was her beckoning and the needs of we, the warm dark we, which brought me back inside the manor. The candle exhausts me, as does this recounting. Into the warm dark we. To my children, if nothing else, the smell of leaves, the rotting underlayer, and the crisp, dry new fall permeate my skin. 
keeping close my most recent encounter with we, the warm dark we. <laughs> We linger in my nose, and we, the warm dark we, are more needed and desired now than ever. Adeline beckoned me into the house only to disappear with your arrival. I was upset at the time, thinking the three of you always absent and present at wrong turns. But that day was one of our last encounters, and as I miss you more all the time, even sentiment cannot bring back what you said to me, even as I surrender to the fact that I will never be as apathetic to you as we, the warm dark we, demand. Distraction and desire to see Adeline and to get back to the unlit estate whose wet warmth sits now newly dried onto my skin, plucked your words out of the air, replaced by haunted silence as I played my own ghost. Or that is how it is beginning to feel. Into the warm dark we. My dearest, my dearest, my dearest, Morgan, Daniel, and Madeline. The depths of winter have arrived, and the cold heart of the ground rises up into the air. My eyes glow, and my touch is deft on the skin of those new. Although with the death of the concoctor of the potion, so too will go we, the warm dark we. This is a cleansing like no other, for it is optional, and even as the candle burns within my very skull, and I can scarcely keep my pen aloft, it is not required of me. Nothing is required of any in my sick little band of we, the warm dark we, any longer, but for myself I must cleanse myself before what comes next. It is my hope that I will not see you again, for my next act will be to die. I will go to it, even knowing that my eternal punishment is close approaching and that it shall be damnation. It is not exactly that I have misled you regarding the delectation of the last few seasons. It is just that in my doing so, I have ignored things, and now, now that I do not have to, I will commit one more cleansing to paper, and the contents of the letter should go far to explain why, although these letters are information we collect to be sent to the old families, robbing us of a place to land, should any show interest in a return to individuality, and, as stated, my demise is short at hand. It is not of any matter now, and I will speak of my former life, rather than the more punishing side of we, the warm dark we, which should not be of interest to you after all. I must tell you about the night of the fire, Christmas Eve, only a little over a year ago. Although I was fully committed to my future life at the unlit estate by this time, my intention was to plan a graceful exit. My first mistake was to follow your father out into the night. The lateness of the hour made it a strange one for him to depart, and I must have been aware of the reason for his departure. Still, I felt compelled to shadow him as he made his way out to the edge of the woods, where stood the little cabin of the strange witch he kept. She was the very same who had sold me Nostrum even more ineffective than the druggist wares. I was not the only one who was tracking that night, though, for as I watched your father's tupping, I found myself joined at either elbow by we, the warm dark we. We watched at the window, discussing my feelings which arose at the scene, refraining from wapping ourselves, not due to some mundane moral quandary, Rather, we considered it reprehensible to lighten the purse of another with the promise of relief that will not be fulfilled. It was presented that we could gather my recompense, owed the unlit estate, while bringing her back to the Westermark Manor. Our aim was to force her to conduct the shameful act of arranging a sneaking exit, or otherwise own up to what would be perceived as misdeeds. Perhaps the lovers would be forced into a deception, on Christmas Day no less. Not that it matters, I must lay in the bed that I made, 
But I protested, thinking of you. But we, the warm dark we, were committed to the plan, and it went better than I expected. For the strange little witch did not see us coming, and it was easy to tie her up after your father left. She was a small thing and could be carried between two through the empty streets of Fisher's Gap, up into the manor and deposited in my bed, where she would stay bound until morning. As we looted the room, we were able to gather more than was expected, as this was a task I had planned to do alone. We crept silently, not one of us did not prefer the dark, and all would have gone as intended, but a candle had been set on the floor in the middle of the hallway, presumably by Madeline. We tripped over it, and the resulting fire might have been manageable, had it not been for our aversion to light. Adeline said that she would wake you, and perhaps it was she who did so. Oh my to my mind, it is no matter. Your blood turned to ashes is on my hands. For I did nothing to keep you alive, because there was nothing I could have done. And I knew this as I fled into the night, spirited to the unlit estate, where, as I said, things have soured. <laughs> Lined up before me are we, the warm dark we, before an axe, which is taking off suffering heads one by one, before placing them back on their bodies and wrapping their necks in the curtains as the taint of dawn floods the world. And I will go line up with them, but not before I say that everything I ever wanted for you was nothing I ever offered, which does not mean that I did not love you, only that love enjoys a warped reflection in the world, as if through water. And I hope that for the remainder of your days, the water is warm, despite all the past has led me to expect. The letter does not include a complimentary close, nor a signature, or even a period to end the last sentence, although throughout grammar is considered. My search for the unlit estate in the areas surrounding Fisher's Gap was not fruitful, and there is no known massive decapitation in the area. <laughs> Though the unlit estate is not well described, I could not find anything that could potentially bear the name, nor was there any evidence of those who call themselves We the Warm Dark We. Thank you for listening to the Domestic Aggressive Podcast. This has been the Warm Dark We, the fourth installment of the Year Without Summer Quartet. My name is Meredith Lindgren, and I wrote and read the episode. All sound design and music is by Nathan Paul. We are taking a break for April, but we will be back on May 10th. <laughs>